Hey everyone, Josh here, and today is full of the unexpected. It is a kooky collection of things that you will see just here. First up, the indie rock band Ann Horse. This super cool duo came into the studio to talk to me about their new album just before they went on this huge tour. So take a look. Hey everyone, today I'm here with Kate Cooper and Damon Cox, the two members of the super cool indie rock band and Horse. Now I'm going to ask them about the title, but first I want to let you know that they have a new album out today called Walls, and we're going to talk about that, the name of their band, and all of that good stuff. So welcome and thanks for stopping by. I know you guys have a crazy busy schedule, so I'm glad we got a chance to chat before you're on your way. Thank you so, for having So congratulations us. on the album, it's amazing. Thank you. Uh, so tell us a little bit about Walls, like how it came about and what it is and why it's different and all of that. We, we recorded it in Vancouver last summer, and um, it was uh, two, like two years in the making, two I years, guess? Yeah, two years in the making. Mm -hmm. Well, because we put out our last record and then we went on tour for two years. Wow. So we had to find the downtime to write the record. You know, we'd have a two weeks home or in a random spot in the world and we'd write. It was the first time we, we got to actually sit down and write a record and talk about how we are going to make a record. Like we set out to make a record. The first record was kind of like... It was an accident. It was a little bit of an accident. It was half a demo and then it became a record. Yeah, it was like two EPs that were kind of put together. There wasn't much of a, a structure to it, I guess. And how do you guys divide up the sort of duties between... Is one of you a songwriter primarily and one a lyricist? You guys co collaborate on both? Who comes up with the concepts? Like, it, What's the sort of dividing line here of job responsibilities? It's, um, it's like that Metallica documentary where we sit around with lyrics. No, I'm only really joking. <laughs> no, I'm only really joking. Um, uh, I guess I start with the, 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 the bare bones mm -hmm. and the lyrics and, and an idea and I'll put it down and usually I wait till I have like 10 songs, 10 embryonic things mm -hmm. and then I email them to Damon because we live in different places, but when we lived in the same town, we still did it that way. And then he'll go away and listen to them, and then when time permits, we get into a room and kind of block out a period of time. Like on this record, I went to Melbourne, mm -hmm. Australia, where Damon lives, and we had, I think we had six weeks in a practice room, and oh. we went there every day. Okay, so when you guys set out to make an album like, uh, like Walls, is, do you discuss like, hey, you know what, this is what I, because I, I always wonder this about musicians, I, I'm so not musical, so you have to me forgive either. me asking like the idiotic questions about no, music. No, but we're not musical for real. Oh, I, I don't believe you, but I really am not. So when you set out to make an album, do you think like, hey, you know what, this is what I want the takeaway to be for our audience, or do you just sort of like write it and hope that they're going to attach to something? Yeah, I, th I my head is, my brain is not big enough to consider other people. <laughs> Um, so, I, sometimes... At the time of writing. At the time of... <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, debatably all the time, but um, no. Generally speaking, it, it's... I really admire people who can write with a purpose or mm -hmm. think, I'm going to write this. I can't do that. I just have to, you know, sit down and write and then... And, you know, I have to write a lot of bad songs to write a couple good ones, you know what I'm saying? So, it's just, it just comes out and if, if I think too much about it or if we thought too much about the process, I'm... I'm not sure what would happen, so I try not to think about it. Why an horse? Everybody asks me, they're like, oh, that's improper. Why did you choose an article? Arguably. Just to, to annoy people. Oh. Just, yeah, mm. just to I'm all for it. No. I annoy people People either, every day. either pas passionately hate it or, or they think it's okay. Yeah. I, I, or they love it. <laughs> like yeah. the Murray from The Wiggles, I said loved it. Right? Oh, really? He literally, it, I was... From that point on, I'm confident in the decision that Ann Horse was a fine band name. It, it has got the Murray of the Wiggles stamp of approval. Yes. Well, he, he came up to us after a show and he said, Ann Horse, I get it. <laughs> it grammatically funny. I get it. It and is funny. he told his son on the way to the show, he's like, we're going to see a band tonight. And, and he explained the grammar to his son. And I was like, that's amazing, teaching. My sister is a book editor okay. in Australia. and. A long time ago we had a conversation where she told me that N before H was correct. And mm -hmm. it is arguably correct in some cases. Right. And I mean, we could go deep on this, I'm not going to. But some style manuals still say that it's right. And But, but the people who were like, it's wrong, are like passionate. And I'm like, really, you care that much? <laughs> like, I'm just glad that we've got you talking about grammar. <laughs> you got the right person, because I, I do talk about grammar. In Same. Fact, 
Um, I have to ask you this, like, if I stole your, whatever, your iPod or whatever you listen to music on, what is it that you guys are listening to now? All sorts of stuff, really. Um, the, the new Jessica Lee Mayfield record we've been listening to a lot. She's, we've toured with her before and we really love her. She's amazing. Um, the, the new PJ Harvey record. Yeah, amazing. It's amazing. The new Licky Lee record. Um, I actually, on Record Store Day, actually, you know, a few days after Record Store Day, I went to my local record store and bought this uh, old Bob Dylan bootleg nice. from one of, like, a university show he did just before he broke. Uh -huh. So he didn't, re he was no one at this it point. It was almost an opening slot on some folk festival that yeah. a, a university had put on, and, and this recording had been found in someone's basement. Like some 40 record years later. Wow. Yeah. Basement, and, and it was a record. never been heard. It sounds amazing, and it's just... It's just a really great record. I, I do love how you refer to them as records. Well, I have to say. Well, they are. As opposed to an album or. Well, you know, they were. Like, we were at my house for the last 10 days and I have a record player. Fantastic. So they're all records. I and, love that. And I just got a record player a few months ago, so I've been buying lots of records. So. As musicians, are you ever like, oh, damn, I wish we could press it on vinyl? We did. Oh, you did? Yeah. yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I know. It's really yeah. exciting because we've never had any music on vinyl until mm -hmm. now. So That's great. Um, we have a record. That that is amazing. And if you think, and do the kids know what a record is they, these days? They, really do. they love it. They do. And you know what? It's the only medium of music. I'm going to be pulling numbers out of nowhere here, but it's over the last X amount of years. It's the only medium of music that has increased in sales. Records. Yes. Final Very records. Yeah. Now, if you were going to make another record, um, is there somebody who you were like, you know what? I got to get this person on the, yes. I, on our record. Yes. Besides the Wiggles. We had this conversation, Kate Blanchett. Oh. Admittedly, oh, yeah. I don't know how she would be on our record, but we really want to work with her. All right. Yeah. Like, have her sing or like spoken word or know. just, you don't care. She, she could, could just, just sit there. She could just be in the studio like smoking. smoking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. I don't know. We, we decided, we were watching Coffee and Cigarettes the other day and I was like, it's Kate Blanchett. Because, you know, we could do, I mean, Kate, if you're out there, we could <laughs> do the music for a film or, a, you know, a play you're working on or Australian. That's right. We share a first name. <laughs> Admittedly, <laughs> the spelling of hers is a little better than mine, but yeah. you like the, she's the, so, the C. I love the C. But she's such a like she's just like she's so such a talented creative woman and I think it would be cool to not, to work with someone who wasn't a musician. That would be amazing. Yeah. And and you guys are out on tour and, and what is it like? Like, you know, being away from home and being together constantly. Do you fight? Do you just like, you know, get on each other's nerves or we, we do pretty well. Yeah. Um, there are times the when you've been out for a few months and you're in each other's space all the time. And the occasional headlock. Testing, but <laughs> headlocks and, you know, headbutts. Headbutts. Now and then. <laughs> well, yeah, we do We do, uh, we do, do very well. We do pretty well. Do you like touring and... and well, we better because we always do it. So. Well... It is, you know, there's, there's, there's positive and negative. I mean, you guys have a rigorous tour schedule. I was looking at it and it's like, it's pretty rigorous. Yeah. So. I can imagine it must get tired yeah. at a certain point. Yeah, it, yeah. it does, but I mean, I, I think as you grow as a band, it, certain things get easier and your infrastructure changes, so you know, you can bring some people out and sometimes you get to bring home to you, you know, mm -hmm. friends come out or loved ones come out and you just, you just kind of have to find a way to make it work in a way that you can still work and be a happy person, because if you're unhappy on the road, there is actually nothing worse. Mm. And we've been that. We've been there. So yeah, you know. Yeah. Thank you again for stopping by and talking with me and, and taking time out of your crazy busy schedule. The album is called Walls. It's out now. Run, don't walk. I promise you will love it. We're going to show you a clip now from uh, their video, Dressed Sharply.
you send me. Okay, you know how there are certain things that are on your list of must-dos before you die? My next segment was not even close. It is samurai sword fighting. But I have to say, I went down to the West Side Dance Project and took a class, and it kind of changed my life. It was so amazing. I think that was really the beautiful part of it was the surprise. It was such a beautiful blend of the mind, body, and spirit. And my instructor, Robbie, was so patient with this really awful student. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Hey everyone, today I'm at the West Side Dance Project with samurai sword expert Rob Raji, and he's gonna teach me all about everything I need to know about swinging a sword today. So thanks so much for coming down and, and sitting with me and chatting. So I, I don't, like I think I said to you before, like I don't even know where to begin, so maybe you can sort of figure out like, where do we start with this whole thing? So let's, uh, let's start by just talking about the sword itself. Okay. All right, not any particular kind of sword, but just the sword. Right. The sword um, is, uh, the, is a tool that is made for killing another human being. Yeah. All right. Let's just be honest about That's it. That's what right? it's there for. It's kind of the assault rifle of the Middle Ages. <laughs> right? Because any other weapon, a bow and arrow, an axe, you can use for another purpose. Mm -hmm. right? A sword has no other purpose other than to take the life of specifically a human being. Right? And so through the ages, the sword has adapted as technology adapted. Right? As uh, knights started covering their body with more armor, swords started getting thinner and thinner so they could stab into the armor rather than hacking through the armor. Well, in the East, the sword uh, followed a different evolution. Uh, because it, it's an iron poor culture over there, they relied less on heavy plates of armor and more on on um, different tactics and different weapons that didn't rely on that heavy shell. Um, so all the, the swords is, uh, it, from the, in the East that we know of today kind of have their roots traced back to China. A sword, um, no matter how sharp you make it, will still dull, right? You can use a harder steel to give you a better edge, but the harder steel that you put into your sword, the easier the sword will break. Right? Okay. The more brittle it is. Right, right. Right. Conversely, if you make it out of a soft metal, right, then you, uh, it won't break, but it will get dull very quickly. Right? So the Japanese uh, uh, swordsmiths figured out a process by fusing two types of metal, a hard steel and a soft steel, together so that you have a very hard edge and a very soft back. And actually, when you take these two metals and you uh, heat them up, and then plunge them into water, that's what gives the blade its signature curve, because it's two metals that fuse together, together and bend on one another and give it that very graceful curve to it. And when someone begins, um, what is it that you, what does the introduction to this, this consist of? The introduction, uh, well, it's interesting. We, the introduction isn't all that different from the more advanced learning, where you have to learn the basics uh, of how to handle the sword. This martial art, um, it's called Sijun Do Bab. In, uh, that's, my teacher is Korean, right? He studied in Korea and Japan. So he took a form called uh, Iaido, Japanese Iaido, um, which is the art of drawing the sword from the scabbard and making a cut at the same time, right? And added um, his knowledge of Korean sword styles to make Sijun Do Bab, right? And that's the form that I study uh, and the form we're going to work on today. All right, so sword teacher, you're gonna try and show me. I already, my, the disclaimer being that I'm old and clumsy. So, um, and they're gonna put a sword in my hand. So we'll see uh, what happens there. So you yeah. ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Am I ready? You're ready. All right, let's go. Let's do it. Okay, so feet together, left hand at the side, fingers flat, back straight. Ready, bow. Now we're going to kneel down. Now bring out the sword and the scabbard in front of you. Now you're going to place down the sword with the handle towards your left side, like so. Now just like you bowed to me, you're going to bow to your sword. And let's stand up. Good. All right. <laughs> we're going to learn how to move with the sword. Okay. All right? When I say one, yeah. I want you to slide your right foot 
forward like so. All right, ready, step forward, 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 back, back. So let me show you um, uh, a little secret of the sword. Bring your blade up, okay, and go forward one. Okay, when you're cutting to there, uh -huh. if I'm your opponent, you're not cutting anything yet, right? So watch, your arms are going forward here, but you're not cutting, okay. right? Now, you have no choice except for your arms to come back in, right? Well, that's where the cut starts. Oh, I see, right? okay. So you're slicing on the way in, not on the way out. And ready, cut, and stop. Stretch out your legs. Cool. So so far so good. So far so good. Okay, great. All right. God, it's wooden. There you have it. I bet that is something you never thought you would see. So a special thanks to Rob Rashi for teaching me the basics of samurai swords and everybody here at the West Side Dance Project. Remember, you can get all the information about classes here at swordclassnyc.com. So come on down. I promise you, you'll have a great time. And as always, we'll see you again next time. In the world, there are those people who are, well, angels. And my next guest is truly one of them. She is an exceptional human being, and it was such an honor and a privilege to sit down with Judith Light and talk to her about everything LGBT. And for all you theater queens out there, you know, she was just nominated for her starring role in the Broadway play Lombardi. So here we are, sort of mid conversation. Check it out. When was it that you actually began? You said to yourself, you know what? This is something I need to do. Do you remember what year that was? It was 1987 or 1988. Um, it, was, it was really, I mean, I, I was doing things piecemeal um, and taking care of people and, you know, going to funerals and all of that stuff. But it was really, it was after I did the Ryan White story that I, I began in earnest. And Herb Hampshire, my manager, and I started talking about it, about what I could do, how, how I could be used, in what way. Because I'd always said that I, I, I think celebrity is wonderful. I, I, believe me, I mean, and I've always said the the perks are are great, and I'm incredibly grateful. But um, life is is much better to me when I'm finding a way to be of service in some way. And so I I said to her, I, that's what I wanted to do with my career. I, I want to use whatever platform I have to be able to find a way to make a difference. And I said let's talk about how to how to do this and so he said that I can I can I can do this with you and he started writing my speeches and I started going around to different places and I started giving speeches and do you as an actress and also as an activist do you choose like sometimes you, you look at a role and you say you know what this may be a smaller film but this is an important role this is something I need to do do you do you feel that connection through your work as well I always feel that connection in my work. I feel it because I, I feel that the women that I have the, the opportunity to play um, have something to say, some way to educate, some way to uh, elevate, some way to inspire. And, and that's why when we did, I don't know if you saw the movie that we did, Save Me, um, which my husband wrote and her produced and I'm in. and. Um, we produced it with um, several other friends of ours, you know, and it was in Sundance, and, and it was important um, for me to play a role like that of a woman who is trying to get gay men to become straight um, because I wanted to portray that person so that people could understand where maybe this woman was coming from. We wanted to do that film as a way to start a conversation. And to have, a, and, and the Christian community was incredibly uh, supportive of us in that film. Um, on Christianity Today, the blog was the morning after we opened in, in Sundance, uh, essentially, was the, the writer said, Is it possible that the gay community and their supporters are more generous to us than we are to them? Hmm. Well, it was really uh, definitely an interesting choice of a role because, you know, you, you talked a little bit about 
during the Ryan White story, and and uh, you know one could see how that aligns sort of with your particular personal views. I mean, this woman was, like you said, trying to convert gay men into being straight, and yet in the movie, it's just you come across as an incredibly empathetic character as well, and it's a it is a really interesting opening to a dialogue. Uh, it was very important to all of us as producers that we made sure, and Herb was on us constantly about this. Um, it was essential that no one was um, denigrated in any way. Because if you have that, you polarize people and you take sides. And you can see the pain that these people are in. And one of the, that was one of the reasons that we wanted, uh, I said, let's have her have had a gay son who killed himself because she was not there for him, not present for him. Um, and, and it was very important to all of us that we maintained that level of um, openness to all of it. You're currently appearing in the play Lombardi on Broadway, um, eight shows a week. Right. <laughs> How the hell do you find time <laughs> to do it all? Like, you're sitting here talking with us, you, I, doing, I'm sure, a thousand other things. You're on the board of the Point Foundation. How do you find time to do it all? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> How do you find the time? It's like, you know, you contacted Herb, and Herb let me know that you wanted to do this. And it's like, I said, OK, this is important. I have to clear my schedule for this. And the things, the other things fall into place. And I find that if I am using myself wisely and well and committing to the things that matter to me and that make a difference to me, I find myself getting more centered. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, I'm able to use my time more wisely and, and more powerfully. Being prepared and ready for the show is definitely a priority, and, um, and making sure that I'm really present and there for everybody that I'm working with, because I love them so much. And I love this play, and I, I, I watch people come. It's so incredible, Josh. They're, like, people are coming to this play that have never been to a Broadway show before. People come in Packers gear. They're standing up at the end because they're being inspired. And that's why I love this play. You know, I was watching TV the other day and I saw a preview for Nurse Jackie, and I know that you're appearing okay. as the lesbian mom on Nurse Jackie. With Susie Kurtz with as Susie my Kurtz. longtime partner. Amazing. And we're old friends, and we had such a good time. I, I can't. I, it's, can you imagine? I mean, no. can you imagine? No. I mean, how much fun That's amazing. we had. And the show is so fabulous, and the producers are great, and the writers are great. It's just like, I mean. And it's amazing you get to bounce between that and the Broadway show and doing your activism. And do you, do you feel like I'm in the pocket in one particular place, or do you really sort of thrive on the ability to sort of move from place to place in, in terms of your personal life and, and as well as your professional life? It's so funny that you asked me this because I was just thinking about this today, I thought, I want to just sit down <laughs> in one place. I said, oh, I just need to stop and clean the closet. <laughs> and I said to myself, oh, you funny girl, <laughs> you would be so unhappy. I am so blessed. I just, I think I would be not as happy as I am. I think in my mind that it would be a good idea to be on a porch somewhere <laughs> or just, you know, in some fabulous penthouse in New York, you know, just, but I not don't, possible. I don't, I don't, I don't think I would feel as alive and as, um, being able to take the gifts that have been given me and Giving, getting to give them back, I don't think I would be as happy. So I love that I get to go from film to television to the theater to, to do my activism and, and to get to be with the people that I love. Um, I, I'm, I'm incredibly blessed. Well, selfishly, yes. we're glad that you don't slow down and uh. that you 
are involved in as many things as you are. So when I say thank you, I, I, I say thank you for myself and certainly from everybody that I work with, but really from the sort of world at large. Like, I don't know what we would do without you, Judith Light. You mm. are an, truly an inspiration. And like I said, every day I'm like, she's doing that, she's doing that. And it's just, it's truly remarkable. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And I appreciate you coming in and talking with us today and, and thank you for, for everything. Me. Thank you. But you have to remember one thing. I get back from your community way more than I give. Oh. And that carries me. So you should know that too. Well, thanks, Eddie. Thanks. Mm -hmm. thanks. Well, I told you it was going to be a kooky collection of things today. A special thank you to all my guests, but especially the warm and wonderful Judith Light. If you want to write to me, remember, you can always reach me at justjosh at heartv.com. That's justjosh at heartv.com. And thank you for tuning in, and I will talk to you again soon. I was waiting for the Federal Express truck to go by. And it was such a privilege and an honor to sit down with. I told you it was going to be a funny of ah, Sorry. That's big, opening. So you know how I'm always bitching about something that's getting on my nerves? Well today, after, I don't know, 16 years of living in New York City, I came to the realization that the best way to cruise men is on the subway train. I was on my way to work today, and I, I don't have a very long commute. I fell in love no less than three times. Tall, beautiful, Nordic blonde guy, shaved head, punk in like red pants and a really cute butt, and this amazing sort of swarthy guy at the other end of the car. And it dawned on me, wow, this is where all the beautiful men are. So if you're coming to New York, I highly recommend hitting the rails, okay? It's a new idea to me, and I wanted to just share it with you. So just saying. That's big, opening.